Hello. Today we're doing an interview with Dave Sadenwasser, head of the Vilas County Zoning and Planning Department. Vilas County has been a leader in shoreland zoning and other lake protection activities for many years. And we'll look to Dave to explain how and why this is the case. This interview is being conducted by Lynn Markham and Karen Blaha from the Center for Land Use Education. So good morning, Dave. Oh, good morning, thanks for having me. You bet. Um, so we have a set of four questions this morning, um, some nested questions in there, and we're going to start by talking about lakes classification. Um, so my first question is, how do you use lakes classification in the Vilas County Shoreland Zoning Shoreland Protection Ordinance today? Uh, Vilas County has used lakes classification in our Shoreland Zoning Ordinance since 1999. Uh, the the use of that was greatly affected by Act 55, of course. So today, the main ways that we use it are to determine uh, the size of boathouses that we allow. And we especially use it for mitigation for things such as uh, impervious surfaces or um, stormwater management, that type of thing. Uh, that's the main way that we use it now, where we require a higher degree of mitigation on some of the more environmentally sensitive lakes. Okay, great. Um, and now, to me, the most interesting questions. Um, how has the culture and ethic of lake protection developed in Vilas County? Where does it come from? Who contributes to that? And I think I'll start there and then I'll get into your county board questions a little sure. later. Well, in Vilas County, we're blessed with a tremendous amount of lakes. We have about 1,300 of them. Um, and riparian landowners have a long history of taking great pride and ownership in the lakes that they live on. So we've had an active community um, that has been striving for lake protection for years, you know, back into the 70s and 80s. So it's really been an ethic here for a long time. I think we are aware in Vilas County that we're hitched to our lakes for success in everything we do because we're a tourist area, um, we're a retirement community, and that's what draws people here. So it's well known um, by everyone here that it's important to protect and keep our lakes healthy for the success of everyone that's involved. So it's sort of been ingrained for a long time. Um, and, and it's understood that that's an important resource that we need to protect both for the environment and for the success of the community as a whole. Okay. And, and who contributes to that culture, that ethic? The the riparian landowners certainly uh, do to a large degree because they're very heavily invested with the body of water they live on, right? Mm -hmm. um, some of the partner groups out there, so, such as Muskies Inc. or Ducks Unlimited or Trout Unlimited, mm -hmm. um, they contribute with that too because they're the sportsmen and women who use those resources. Uh, the the government of Vilas County and the individual towns also contribute to that too. Um, our Land and Water Conservation Department does a great job with programs helping landowners and lake districts and towns uh, promote water quality and healthy lakes. Um, and we try to have regulations that also promote healthy land use adjacent to those lakes. So it's sort of a community effort um, that everyone has a stake in because we all do understand the importance of that resource. Yeah, okay, great. Um, and then specifically about the, the county board and your county zoning committee, um, mm -hmm. how do you get support from your county board chair to appoint people who support Shoreland zoning to your zoning committee? Or do you always? Um, have you had anti-zoning people appointed to your zoning committee? And how do you nurture or grow um, that support for Shoreland zoning among your committee members and among the county board? Yeah, uh, our county board chairman and over the time have been really good about appointing diverse people to our zoning committee. So we've never had an instance that I can remember in my time here where it was stacked one way or the other. They tend to put people on 
who are on the board who show interest. And so we've had a number of people who are riparian landowners or who are um, very uh, adept at shoreland protection and very interested in it. And we have had some people who are a little more anti-zoning. Um, what I've learned over time is the people who are anti-zoning who get put on our committee tend to start to come around once they actually become part of the functioning um, working of the zoning department uh, because they start to see sides of it that they never realized or aspects of it that they never maybe realized before. Uh, but our county board chairs have been pretty good about not stacking the deck either way. Um, and we've had a lot of very diverse zoning committees that represent both the interests of the shoreland protection people and the other interests as well. So I feel fortunate in that way. Um, because we've had this long history of, of, of shoreland protection and understanding the importance of it, we tend to get a lot of support from our committee for things that protect the shoreline. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, my next question is how do lake groups or the Vilas County Lakes and Rivers Association affect the level of protection provided by shoreland zoning? How do they engage or inform your office or get involved? So we unfortunately haven't had a great history of working with the lake districts and, and um, lake associations or the VCLRA. Uh, we're working on that slowly but surely to build those relationships. Uh, they work very closely with our land and water conservation folks. The main way that they help support um, lake protection and shoreland zoning right now is, to a large degree, there are eyes and ears on lake shores. So um, they are the ones who report when there are violations. There are ones who report when there are issues, and that alerts it, uh, us to it in a great way. I think that there are opportunities to go beyond that. Um, and we've started the very beginnings of starting to work with some of those groups uh, in terms of especially education. Um, a lot of people who do violations just don't understand or know there's rules. And it's, it's a lot easier to be able to keep track of who's new on a body of water for the people that are there, right? Uh, local communities, lake districts, lake associations, they're always keeping track of sales and new potential members, right, uh, to bolster their their groups. So there's great potential to work with them to get information out about shoreland zoning restrictions and requirements or about resources that homeowners can use to help protect water quality and shoreland zoning, things like um, healthy lakes grants or those type of things. So mm -hmm. The great power there is in their sort of concentrated knowledge of their particular uh, lake and water system. And I think that there's benefits to working them. And I'm looking forward to growing those relationships as we go forward. Sure. OK, thank you. Um, and then my last question is related more to the state level policy. You mentioned Act 55, which said, look, local governments, counties cannot be more restrictive than the state standards that are in statute and administrative code. Um, if local control, county control could be returned for say two of the seven shoreland zoning standards, um, which standards would you suggest that local control is returned for and why? I love this question. I've been thinking about this all morning. Um, <laughs> so. That's a great question. Uh, the one that I for sure off the bat would say would be lot size standards. And I think that there's enough research out there to show that the density of development on a lakeshore um, has great impact on the quality of the resource. So there are lakes everywhere that I think all of us know are for all intents and purposes, kind of done for, right? The development's happened, it's there, it's dense. Um, we know the, the problems that come with it. But there are large swaths of the state where there are still lakes that can be saved, right? And so I think allowing the individual counties to um, set their own lot size standards is a really important thing. And that was one of the things that we used to use the lakes class for. 
mm -hmm. uh, where the more um, sensitive they were to development, the larger the lot size. Uh, and it worked well for a long time. So I think that's the first one I would say for sure. Can um, I ask a follow up? Yes, please do. <laughs> so, so certainly you're aware of land division ordinances mm -hmm. and that some towns and counties have used those. Yeah. So why do you prefer to have those larger lot sizes in shoreland zoning rather than in a land division ordinance? Or do you think it's legally defensible in a land division ordinance? I think it's legally defensible in the land use ordinance until the legislature chooses to close the the loophole um the reason i would prefer to have them in a shoreland zoning ordinance is because you can apply those standards specifically to the shoreland and you don't have to apply them countywide. i it shoreland areas are a very unique land feature right and i think that the state has recognized that by having the mandatory shoreland zoning in the hands of the counties, they recognize that that first thousand feet back from a lake, 300 feet from a river, is a, is a sensitive area that has great ability to affect the public trust or the, the waters of the state. So I don't see, uh, to me, uh, to have the tool where you're able to regulate them differently than everything else is important. Um, it's also important because from a purely government thing or view, that's a, a large difference in your tax base as well. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to regulate them, I think, differently than 40s in the middle of the forest or 40s in an agricultural area. And if you're into doing it with a subdivision ordinance, you have to kind of apply those rules across the board to a large degree to stand up to the to the tests in the court. So that's why I would prefer to have them in the shoreland if you could. Um, what else do we have? Um I think the impervious surface rules are good. I like those to be, I think the standardization is pretty good and I'm biased because we had those rules since 1999. So, so the 300 or, or the 30% and the 15% we've been doing for a long time. Um, uh, I believe it or not, I believe that the rebuilding of the structure rules, I understand why they used to prohibit it, but I think that those are reasonable and, and don't hurt um, the shoreline as much as some of the other changes. Um, the thing that I would probably ask be changed or that would go back to local control would be the ability to size the buffer however you want, mm -hmm. right? Because, I mean, Lynn, you've shown enough science to me over the years to show the effects of having that buffer at 35 or 75 or 100, right? We We know how that interplays. So in the same vein of controlling density on your more sensitive areas, to be able to control that buffer in areas where it hasn't been taken away yet to a larger degree, I think would go a long way to helping preserve water quality and preserve the nature of our lakes and rivers. So that would be the other standard I'd probably look to get put back in local control. Okay. Great. Thank you, Dave. Um, anything else you'd like to add related to Shoreland zoning, future policy, how it's working in Vilas County now? Yeah, um, it's it's working. We've done it for a long time. Shoreland zoning is always a difficult balancing act between the the people who want to preserve our lakes because they're important natural resource and the people who want to utilize them for development. So the trick is to find that balance in there. Um, and it's a really hard thing to do. Uh, it's also, you know, one of the problems we have is just the sheer amount of shoreland we have versus the number of people in our office. Um, you're, you you know, you chase stuff all the time. So the point of shoreland zoning, I think, is to have thoughtful ordinances. Um, make sure that you are controlling things the right way for the right re reason. 
and make sure whatever you have in there is legally defensible should you have to enforce on it and make your best effort to make people comply through education and and through enforcement if you have to but um i would encourage anybody to hit the education aspect hard uh because i have found then we have found that your best bang for your buck and time and effort is to get people educated before they have a chance to do things that are against your ordinance or bad for the lakes. Thanks, Dave. And so I have one additional question, and that is what do you see as potential ways to use lakes classification or just other shoreland protection in order to achieve greater lake protection um, in our current scenario where local governments are not allowed to be more restrictive on state standards? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, we used to use lakes class, like I mentioned, to determine lot size and frontage requirements, and that's sort of out the window. But I think it's a valuable tool um, to be used for a lot of the things that you have the ability to regulate. Um, I think that uh, it's a useful tool for regulating things like uh, density in your viewing corridor, right? Uh, there is no density standard for vegetation in your viewing corridor. So, so in Vilas County, we have one. We don't let you clear cut your viewing corridor. Um, but you can adjust the density of vegetation that has to remain based on the susceptibility of the lake to its development and its its pressure, right? So you can use lakes class for that. Um, another thing that I think would be really interesting to look at would be to use lakes classification to uh, regulate the size of the boathouses that you permit on, on lakes. And we do that to a small degree. Uh, some of our smaller lakes, we require a smaller boathouse located farther away, but you could to definitely use a lakes classification to regulate size and location of boathouses within the setback. Um, the other area, another area that I think it can be useful is for like a buildable area standard. We put into our ordinance in 2017, I believe, uh, a buildable area standard for shoreland lots. So we require 16,500 square feet of contiguous buildable area. It's area outside of wetlands, outside of setbacks, outside of easements and those type of things. So you could have um, a buildable area setback, which is not regulated by NR 115. Um, it's not regulated by 59.692, so it is open to counties to do. And you could key that to a lakes classification where you require a larger buildable area on a more sensitive water body. Um, there's a lot of things like those, those types of things that you can use your lakes class to to provide that sort of extra layer of protection to your, your waterways that are more sensitive to development or that turn over more slowly or or that type of thing and achieve a lot of the same goals that people were doing pre-Act 55. Um, I kind of think it's just to, to your imagination, you know, but those are some of the ideas that I've always thought might be helpful for that kind of thing. Thank you, Dave. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate you having me and uh, I hope you guys all enjoy your seminar. All righty. Thank you. Take care. Bye.